Well, thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Um, I have an extreme pleasure of introducing Dr. Christine Rogers, Premises Rogers. She's a specialist in the donors and uh, training United Kingdom. And I think we have many things in common, don't we, Christine? We both had a graduate training in the UK. Uh, either yours and uh, Guy, is that yes. right? Guy, yes. that's right. I did mine in Kings. But you were teaching at Kings as well, weren't you? Yeah. That's right. Uh, but can I just say um, thank you for accepting the invitation. It's a pleasure having you here in behalf of the college. Um, one important aspect of the college is we provide education that's real. We teach and uh, we encourage our students to uh, have an objective approach to treatment plans and, uh, and to be um, not just um, in terms of uh, looking at you know, two at a time, but look at it as a holistic approach to dentistry. And uh, I think your subject today, uh, and I love the question you asked, with starting the pulp and preparing regeneration is a wonderful topic today. So uh, I'd like to introduce you and, uh, and would you please um, take, I'm just gonna sit here and relax and, and um, what you do, you know, go ahead and give your lecture. So, Thank you for being with us and please proceed. Oh, thank you, Sarkis. And I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me to do this. So that I can work the keyboard. Great. So um, my topic for tonight is repair and regeneration in endodontics. And I thought I'd look at the two terms separately because they actually have slightly different implications. But we are actually looking at a form of bifold pulp therapy, which originally when um, attempts were made to see if the pulp could be conservatively treated um, were not encouraged because the results and the outcome were unpredictable. But endodontics seems to be going through a period of change where um, there are paradigm shifts happening everywhere. Um, we jokingly mentioned um, the possibility of something called a ninja access um, a few minutes ago in um, pre-questions before we started. Um, and Mitral pulp therapy is another paradigm shift in which we're re-looking really at what we actually do to achieve a successful outcome for our patients in terms of the treatment we offer. And um, in 2017, there was um, an international meeting for caries. And as a result of that, um, and taking a more minimally biological aspect of um, our treatment, the same thing happens then to endodontics. And the question that arose really was, um, do we need to always remove the pulp? So um, it's not really as, as such as we understand a definition, but um, in terms of repair for bifold pulp therapy, we're looking at trying to preserve the vitality. So not necessarily nerve function, but um, blood flow through the pulp tissue function of um, the coronal and remaining radicular pulp um, for a tooth that's been affected by, if not by destroyed, by caries, trauma or restorative procedures on a bad day in a healthy state. And what we're trying to actually do is when that initial injury occurs, um, the pulp will undergo an inflammatory process, typically everything that's found um, elsewhere in the body. But what we're trying to do with our treatment is to influence that process so that we actually encourage it to not progress through extensive information um, within the pulp and ultimately pulp necrosis requiring root canal treatment, but to see if we can encourage it in the presence of a bioactive material to actually start to repair. So this is a diagrammatic um, representation from um, a really good paper by Smith and Teams in 1995, looking at the biological basis. And effectively, if we have information, then we've got um, pulp space, we're looking to try and create a situation where through the materials that we use, largely the irrigants and medicaments, that we can actually encourage fossilized um, bioactive molecules which are retained in the dentine matrix um, to then actually attract um, multi um, stem cells, 
on the apical tissues or the um, apical part of the pulp to actually re-enter the tooth um, oh, and also along with chemotaxis um, to start in the tree sense to actually um, begin to support the development of blood vessels and nerves, so angiogenesis and neurogenesis. And by that then, as the cells move up, if we've got and damaged through the process to actually start to differentiate into odontoblast-like type cells. Our odontoblasts are cells that we can't actually regenerate. The post-mitotic cells, once they actually degenerate, um, that's, that's that. Um, but we can, under certain influences, um, actually encourage these multifluorent um, stem cells to actually differentiate into them. In terms of initial vital pulp therapy for repair processes, the tooth, this molar tooth diagrammatically is divided into half. On the left side, we can see what reaction we get from the odontoblasts which are lining the um, pulp corn um, in terms of a mild stimulation from um, caries or perhaps um, a small injury, something restoratively where our burrs may not actually have sufficient irrigation, whatever the reason. And the odontoblasts will actually form a regular form of dentine to form a dentine bridge. And this is termed reactionary dentine. And it's partly also to distance the pulp from the insult or injury that's stimulating that reaction. If we have a larger area of stimulus, and usually this would be caries, um, we would have an infective element, we've got bacteria present, but that um, the presence of those and their activity are likely to cause degeneration of the odontoblasts, in which case then we'll have these multiplur uh, <laughs> dental stem cells um, migrating to this area, forming into these odontoblast-like types and laying down um, a reparative type of dentine. It is a dentine bridge, but it's not necessarily regular in shape. It may or may not have tubules in. It may be amorphous and it may be a solid block of dentine, but invariably it has gaps between it. And this has um, a knock-on effect to some of the treatment protocols um, that we might actually consider so in terms of the actual therapeutic procedures themselves, um, some of these terms will be familiar, but the terms actually keep changing on a relatively regular basis. So we have the direct pulp cap, and the definition is actually a description of the process itself. It's important in a direct pulp cap, whether it's um, a traumatic injury or carious exposure, that we are working in an aseptic working field. And this is actually mandatory that there has to be um, dental dam isolation of the tooth that we're trying to treat. And basically we apply whichever biomaterial um, we're using directly onto the exposed pulp and then immediately place a permanent restoration. We can consider if we, with a partial pulpotomy, remove a small portion of the exposed pulp. This has partly got to do with the length of time that the pulp may be exposed before we've actually initiated treatment, for instance, in a case of traumatic injury, but also in terms of some of the visual observations we'll make during course of treatment. Again, the biomaterial is applied directly onto the exposed pulp and a permanent restoration is placed, so there's no delay with this. A full pulpotomy is complete removal of the coronal pulp. And we'll look again at the um, physical signs. I've got a couple of cases to show um, where we demonstrate um, the signs that we're looking for. And we remove the, um, we resect the pulp tissue to the level of coronal orifices, or the can canal orifices, before we place the biomaterial directly onto the pulp tissue and then place a permanent restoration. And pulpectomy is when we consider that our visual observations are such that um, information is widespread throughout the pulp um, and we remove the pulp and start conventional endodontic treatment over however many appointments it might take us um, before placing, um, in your case as dentists, um, permanent restoration, in our case on a referral basis, a provisional restoration for the patient to return to you for definitive restoration of the tooth. So 
It's an open question. What information do you think we need in order to help us with our decision making processes? What information are we looking for on our pre-treatment assessment? This is a question for our, yes. for our participants. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the question I ask you is, if the patient presents with uh, pain okay. or discomfort, obviously, yes. Uh, uh, what questions would you ask to know the type of therapy that they may require? Would that be correct? Yes, it's to give us an idea of where we might be gauging which of those vital pulp therapy treatments we would be considering. Can we be very conservative? Do we have to completely remo consider removal of the pulp? How do we actually gauge it? I like uh, Isadora, I want you to answer this question for me. Are you there, Izzy? Is it? Uh, apologies. I'm, I'm I can't hear you. Can you hear me? No, I can't. Can you come to the microphone, please? How's that? N not enough. Sorry, so I'm having some difficulty with the audio. Sorry, so I, I want you to come to the microphone because I can't hear you. Apologies, I'm having some difficulty with the audio, sir. So. All right. Okay. There's a chat message as well, Dr. Sarkis. Say that again, I'm sorry. There's a chat message. Yeah. All right, I'm coming here to chat line. Okay. Okay. Can we have can we have someone actually ask the question because it'd be nice to hear. So I want more interaction, please. Okay, but I'll, I'm only going to read this one chat. So location, onset, timing of pain, radiating factors, aggravating factors, inhibiting factors, nature of the pain, duration of pain, severity of pain. Very good. What else would you add to this? Yes, um, potentially, if there's a traumatic incident in the past as well, so you would ascertain the patient history as well. Right. Good. Very good. I okay. guess the age of the patient and uh, root formation, how, whether we have the apical um, constriction occurring or still forming. Okay, I've got a question to ask in the way to do. You're referring a patient and a dentist. Obviously, you're going to write a few things to the patient now. It's a note. What would you suggest to the endodontist that will help in the diagnosis when the patient presents? Please see Sorry, I was a, that was a difficult <laughs> question. Okay. Uh, qu yeah, Electric sorry. pulp test, cold test. Electric pulp and cold test, okay. All right. Uh, and what does it mean? I mean, it's a good, good answer, but can you tell me a bit more about it? And depending on the result, um, yes, it, like if it is a lingering, or negative, and lingering is more towards irreversible pulpitis, and the no response more towards non-vitality, or ne now necrosis. Okay. okay, let me ask, Christina, I'll ask you a question on behalf of the audience. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the question is, the, it's, it's not sensitive to cold, it used to be, but not anymore, mm -hmm. But it's as they said, and then now they try to drink coffee and the pain starts and slowly after about a minute it comes in and starts nagging them, stays there for a while. What do you think is happening there? Uh, so that suggests because of the quality and the nature of the pain that the patient's experiencing, so it's not spontaneous yet, right. I'm assuming. Yes. Um, but it is being triggered by um, a warm or hot thermal stimuli. But basically, the inflammation is affecting in the pulp the deeper C fibers, and mm -hmm. um, so that means that it's more likely to be heading from the coronal pulp tissue into the body of the pulp. From the inflammation point of view, what stimulates the C fibers in a way? I mean, I know they ask. I mean, something has to stimulate the inflammatory products within the pulp. They tend to stimulate. Well, probably it's a mixture of um, the hydrodynamic theory, which is mm -hmm. fluid tubules, right, and right, dental theory, fluid, yeah, yeah. yes, in, in, in and out of the tubules, and also to a certain degree, um, 
you get an increased blood flow, which will put, um, there's nowhere for the pulp tissue to expand because it's in an enclosed environment. Mm -hmm. and anything that is likely to increase blood flow and heat would tend to do that, mm -hmm. would intend to, you know, normally on the surface of the skin on the body, but we've got um, facial planes, we've got space for um, Inflammation, yeah, inflammation to yes, to, to actually expand to, and it's sore and painful, yes, but it's not completely um, excruciating, but it would only take a minor change in the volume of the pulp tissue to then actually start triggering off um, some of these pain endings. Any questions that you would like to ask in terms of what to expect to, the, what to ask the patient so that the response will help you in your decision-making process? Oh, me. Oh, no. No one? Okay. Okay, so, so yeah. we'd actually still do the, I, I'm sure you're all thinking of this, um, the same sort of clinical examination we would. It's hopefully easier for you as your patients are likely to be more regular um, clients of your practice and so therefore you're more familiar with them and what treatment they might recently have had and um, likely causes and which teeth are likely to be um, the culprits for the pain, um, unless the patient can actually specifically identify the tooth. But usually at that stage, um, it involves some sort of periostatic periocal inflammation in order to do that. We'd obviously want to do things like um, assess the periodontal depths. It's important that if we're considering doing any vital pulp therapy treatment, that um, periodontion is healthy. Um, yes, um, if, for trauma, it's always good, some good idea to have of the history, but really from our perspective, what we really want to know is, were you able to undertake any treatment from the time of injury and um, what nature of treatment that might be? So we see trauma um, affecting young and adults, sorry, young children and adults um, at various time intervals. Obviously, you can manage um, the initial stages, but occasionally we do see them when literally they have fallen over and um, they've got soft tissue wounds as well as the wounds to um, the teeth and the adjacent gingiva. So any sort of background information is helpful. And for our more um, senior patients, um, medical history would be good because there are some medical conditions which can alter the inflammatory response, which would be of benefit to know, particularly if you're planning on doing treatment. Um, if they've had radiation, if they are on the medications they're on, some of the times that can cause uh, side effects could be a dry mouth. They could therefore have a high caries rate. The patient may be doing their best to try and monitor that, but that was, it's, it's a struggle. Sometimes also they may have um, difficulty with manual dexterity, which means that they aren't able to clean as well. Um, and caries risk obviously is, is an important factor as to whether or not we conservatively treat a tooth with a deep carious lesion or not, but all sorts of stuff that you're um, likely to consider as part of your day-to-day -day practice. Well, move it to the right. So um, I know Dr. Aaron spoke to you two weeks ago um, about um, diagnosis and um, I've adopted, um, there are really two rules of thought, whether we still use the terms reversible, irreversible, um, and that tends to be still used on the American side of the globe. And um, I'm, it's not really just because of training, but the European Society of Endodontics come up with slightly more fluid terms to indicate what we thought was originally something that kind of ideally went from thermal stimuli, cold sensitivity, sort of maybe then hot, then maybe spontaneous pain, and um, advancing in that sense, but um, it isn't actually our pulp inflammation isn't in stages, it's, it's more of a fluid thing and various parts of the pulp may be different levels of inflammation. So initial pulpitis is the start of these types of symptoms. Um, they've got heightened sensitivity to cold. It could well be that there's, it's just a healthy pulp and we're looking at some form of dentine sensitivity or there may be localised inflammation of the coronal pulp tissue and um, ruling out the fact that you've already probably tried a desensitising preventative um, treatment. Um, we'd be looking at something possibly indirect pulp therapy if there's a carious lesion there or a coronal pulpotomy. Mild pulpitis, we start to get an increased duration of um, sensitivity. It's both heightened in intensity and the time is 
longer that it actually lasts for, significant sooner that the patient is um, aware that there's a change. And all three forms of stimulation, cold, warm, sweet, can trigger it. Um, we are likely expecting there to be inflammation confined to the coronal pulp, but the same treatment options apply. We can consider whether or not the situation is suitable for indirect pulp therapy or coronal pulpotomy. As the symptoms worsen, they lengthen in time and the um, intensity of the reaction. The tooth may be slightly TTP, but we also possibly are getting some spontaneous pain, but actually the patient is now reaching for um, analgesics. Um, histologically, we might think, oh yeah, well, we're getting more extensive localised inflammation, probably still confined to the coronal pulp because it is um, oral factors that are actually stimulating this. And then here we might consider a partial, we're thinking, all right, okay, we might be thinking it's going to be a partial or a complete pulpotomy. So that's just the coronal part of the pulp. Um, when patients start to um, experience really severe pain and there's no, you recognize the patient, they're either coming in and um, they're sipping cold water to try and get pain relief because that works better than analgesics. They haven't slept, they look gray, they, they're holding their hands to their face. It's, it's really quite clear when we have a patient in pain. Then um, we are aware that we are probably looking at a reasonable level of pulp inflammation, possibly extending into the root canal. And um, when we're doing the treatment, then actually this is the first clue that we've got to some level of what the um, level of inflammation is going to be. It's direct visualization of the pulp. And if we find that once we've removed the um, area of pulp close to whatever the causative factor is in this instance, either a restoration or caries, and there's no bleeding after we've done the initial um, resection, say a couple of millimetres, then we can proceed with a coronal pulpotomy. But if we've got continued bleeding and um, every time we try to resect the pulp, we get continued bleeding that doesn't stop within five minutes, then actually we might be then bearing on the side of, we're looking at a complete pulpectomy. So let's have a look at a couple of treatment procedures. We're going to look at initially um, a partial pulpotomy or other terminology with a direct pulp cap. Now, unfortunately, um, one of my hard drives got corrupted. And so my videos of um, teeth that I've treated, um, I can't show. So um, courtesy of a colleague of mine, Dr. Andreas Rees, um, we're going to watch a video he prepared for um, a procedure on um, a tooth one six. Great. So in this, he's looking at the preoperative radiograph. I have to confess that the difference in radio density there wasn't that clear. The red area was the outline of where he thought the current caries was. Here we are removing the restoration. It's fairly self-explanatory, but I'll just do a bit of dialogue. Here we've got soft carious dentine. So under the new um, guidelines for management of carious lesions, we would be removing this. We also need to make sure that we clear the CEJ area because that's where it's likely to occur and spread even with the restoration. Particularly we thought in this instance, the patient's symptoms weren't conducive to it, that we could maybe do an indirect pulp cap. Whereas removing the demineralized dentine, whereas if it's soft dentine, then it's very likely to have bacteria in it. We do need to remove it. So at this stage, we can see pulp exposure. And he's quite right, we don't um, panic. With a dilute solution of sodium hypochlorite, um, we're going to try and achieve on a piece of cotton wool, a sterile cotton wool, we're going to try and achieve hemostasis. We're irrigating the um, irrigating the um, cavity and we can, we've got an option of um, materials that we apply partly depends on what you have in practice but um, largely in this case it would be MTA which obviously he used and he's just placing it over the exposure. He's actually following up now with some calcium hydroxide cement but you could choose um, a different material that actually sets. I'm not sure that's completely set but it looks it and then a layer of glass ionomer cement acid etching then for resin bonding and um, a dual cure composite.
So as we can see, when the pre-treatment assessment was done, um, he actually decided that dental down should be applied and that has to be a consideration. It's mandatory. We can't do any of this treatment without it. The burrs that we're using are obviously sterile. And um, in this instance, we did get a pulp exposure, but as you can see, there wasn't a huge amount of bleeding from that particular wound. So the next one we're going to look at, which will hopefully answer Anita's um, question, is um, a partial pulpotomy or spec pulpotomy and tooth 2-1 on a recently traumatized um, anterior tooth. We can see there's a coronal fracture in the dentist who referred the patient in, had replaced an initial restoration on the crown of the tooth. And um, on gaining access into the pulp, he, he said that there was a pulp exposure and um, the patient was in pain. Um, you can see here we have bleeding pulp tissue. You can see also that we need to have some form of magnification so we can um, visualize this and then an attempt to actually see if we can dry it. And um, this is a paper point, which is from a sterile um, cell pack and it's inverted so that it's the wide end that's actually being applied to the pulp and it's with a gentle pressure. And if we have a look, yes, there's our exposed pulp surface but we've still got a bit of hemorrhaging here. That's arrested and it was arrested by, uh, oh sorry, and that was arrested by applying um, dilute sodium hypochlorite to the pulp and then drying. Now um, concentrations of sodium hypochlorite, all concentrations have been used from 1% to 6%. I would recommend because we're trying to um, reverse the inflammation and maintain vitality of the pulp. Stem cells seem to be susceptible to the higher concentrations of sodium hypochlorite, but that's not necessarily borne out in this research studies. So a lower um, concentration, 1% 1 or 1.25% is my preference. Um, once that's here, we're using biodentine to actually um, place- Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, sorry. With respect to the uh, arresting the bleeding, mm -hmm. uh, what about superoxal hydrogen peroxide? Has that been- Yes, it has been used. It's not been consistently used. So um, we don't actually have guidelines per se. This mm -hmm. is- um, Which are largely adopted for um, vital pulp therapy. Well, right. We're trying to get Biodentine bridge to form. So, um, yeah, in this instance, that would be the case. Biodentine um, is a favorable material. It's um, packed here. We need to get a reasonable depth of material. But the reason why this, if you like, is a choice over MTA is it sets between nine and 12 minutes. So, not necessarily chair side, that's actually a long time when you're waiting, but it allows us to proceed to um, placement. This is the second layer going in. Um, placement of a direct restoration here with acid etching, trimmed back the restoration. Here we can see the um, etched surface. Um, we're going to resin bond it next. And the patient had um, retrieved the fracture, um, the, the fractured part of the crown, which then got resin bonded and placed back on the crown of the tooth, which was a neat. They don't always rebond. Um, when you have the retained portion of crown fracture crown, um, then it can dehydrate. And here we can see it's a lighter color than the rest of the tooth. But as the longer it stays in the mouth and probably within a week, it'll rehydrate and more than likely return to um, similar color of the adjacent incisor tooth. And the tooth would be monitored for a period of time. And here we've got our post-treatment periodical radiograph and we can see this is the biodentin. You can see there's a reasonable thickness here. This is our glass anima composite, and that's the retained portion there. Okay, so regeneration. Now this is partly semantics. There are lots of terms that are used interchangeably in the literature, all implying regeneration, but some papers actually differentiate and say they're not really talking about regeneration. So we have the term revitalization, which actually is solely to do with re-establishment of um, pulp blood supply. And we know that this can be undertaken if, for instance, the traumatized, it's usually traumatized tooth, um, if the apical foramen is one millimeter in diameter or greater. Okay. Revascularization would be the restoration of the blood supply into the pulp. 
and regeneration in the strictest sense would be ideal healing of the pulp so that actually goes back to reconstitute physiological and original tissue and structural and function of the pulp okay um, and yeah it's a good thing just to check in the literature as it keeps um, changing now regeneration we use on um, immature teeth with um, apical periodontitis and the difference to this is um, apexogenesis where we when you have a traumatized immature tooth so i just retract we don't have a closed apical foramen or a, the end part of the root and effectively usually the walls are quite tapered and thin and so basically with a open apex it's really difficult then to consider how you can actually obturate the tooth clearly you have infection um, and you need to do some sort of endodontic procedure but it's difficult to do apexogenesis and um, apex apexification are all about placing material in which will produce a dentine barrier but what we're really hoping for with regeneration is that we'll actually get continued root development in terms of both length and thickness and um so it happens does it happen always no actually so good question so really um what well, histologically when this has been looked at in um, animal studies and it's mostly animal studies i've got a slide a bit later um effectively no we get um the length of the root walls may um, lengthen and thicken, but on the inner aspect, it's actually more like periodontal ligament tissue cement oh. on that side. Those are the cells that have got tracted in. It's very much like healing after surgery. And the um, it is, sometimes it's an osteodentine mixed type material inside there. And the actual soft tissue, if it is there, is more of a, a sort of granulomatous type situation so we haven't regenerated in the pure sense but um we'll, we'll look at some of the considerations for that it's not necessarily a failure but in the true sense of regeneration no we haven't achieved that so here's a tooth this is a tooth one one and um here's a, an image of refinement of a pantal access cavity you can see we've got well you can't see it's a sterile burr but it is a sterile burr and um, we've got dental down in place and here we're gaining access in and once we've irrigated the tooth it's minimal um, we're drying the inside of the tooth um, i'll just go back in image um here we're irrigating and what i'm using is a uh, one percent sodium hypochlorite solution and that's it there in the cavity um, we don't instrument the walls it's one of the criteria for um, regeneration techniques the walls are thin and um, fragile as they are so in terms of disinfecting the root canal space, we're relying on our irrigants and our medicaments. This is a two-stage procedure. Here we're irrigating with um, sodium hypochlorite. Now drying it with a paper point. Um, I want to try and get some sort of length establishment. Um, you can see because it's an open apex, I'm using a reasonably large apical diameter um, hand file. And um, as you know, when you're using an apex acacia on a tooth with an immature root, it the results can be variable and it's not always a true that zero reading. Question, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'll answer the question. So um, yeah, so it's not always a true reliable reading. So um, I would take a radiographic um, image just to confirm that so I know somewhere I am. So here we've got the periapical radiolucent lesion. Here's our wide open apex. Here we can see typical sort of blunt bus and very thin dentine walls. Mm -hmm. How old is the patient here? um it's about nine yeah. ten yeah so basically then um wash it irrigate again and dry and then this is a syringe with calcium hydroxide when i did this case um it was just mixing pure calcium hydroxide powder with sterile water into a paste and then plumbing that within the canal and you can see it sort of backflow and um basically then to place I must miss a slide out here, let's check. Yeah. Um, basically, then to um, disinfect the space and place some cotton wool on top. It's not often that I place cotton wool um, underneath the temporary restoration, but this is really to prevent it all from if the calcium hydroxide is used up and disappears, everything plunging down into the root canal. So I've got to start removing other foreign objects. And there's the calcium hydroxide, cotton wool. Finish. Oh. 
Yours there? Or? Yes, oh, actually, my slides might have got mixed up. Hold on, sorry, excuse okay. me. Okay, go on to the plastic drop side. Not irrigating again. Oh, yes, sorry, my apologies. I skipped ahead too quickly. Sure. So, um, so then that was left in place for a week and the patient was asymptomatic. On the second appointment, came back, removed the temporary restoration and irrigated this time. Now, the local anaesthetic on this second appointment did not contain any vasoconstrictor because with the regenerative technique in an immature um, mom, um, tooth with apical periodontitis, we actually want to induce a bleed. And the aim is that the blood clot that then forms in the canal is acting as a scaffold for all of those cells that I mentioned earlier to actually um, congregate against and start um, doing some reparative um, repair work. Um, so we take the file and we deliberately introduce it beyond the original working length. And we can just about see We could just about see some bleeding here. Now, one of the really difficult things to do, we, we have to use magnification for this. One of the really difficult things to do is to have some control over the volume of blood and actually getting it to um, form a blood clot. Um, in this instance, um, I did actually use collagen as the next stage and just packed that into the top third of the root canal system before applying in this instance as well, biodentine. Um, and it did effectively stop um, and create some hemostasis here. So this is the biodentine going in. Acid etching, it sets, as I said, within 12 minutes, so you can acid etch more or less straight away and then place your restoration. So here we have the biodentine sitting on collagen, which of course is not radiopaque, and here we have the restoration on top. And um, yeah, that's it. So in terms of revitalization, trying to get the blood supply to reform within the tooth, we're still hoping that the pulp stem cells, um, which are described as sitting in vascular niches or within the um, apical papilla, are then released through the activity, migrate up towards the site that are attracted by um, chemotaxis to differentiate ideally into an odontoblast-like type of cell and then to create um, extra dentine. And at the same time, the chemical mediators would attract in um, blood cells and neural cells. Regeneration, so regeneration in its strictest sense would be actually the manipulation of single cells and actually going into a functional tooth. But this is um, going to be incredibly difficult to get all the different tissues to form. So I think at the moment they can form part of a tooth. Um, you can certainly get a bioengineered um, tooth unit to then kind of place back into the situation, into the mouth on an animal, but it's not exactly um, ready yet on a chair side basis. Um, they have successfully used... Um, King's, King's, King's are the role of this, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Um, they have used dental stem cells to actually um, treat um, facial nerve neuralgia. Mm -hmm. um, so the difficult part is getting the vector right. Might be going in a different direction. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, dental stem cells seem to have attracted a lot of interest because um, they can be generated externally as well as there are tissue banks for them um, for this type of research. Um, I mentioned a scaffold before and I mentioned using collagen. In fact, the, um, while I've been here in Australia, I've not actually managed to get a patient to consent to um, the use of collagen. Mostly it's bovine origin. Um, so we don't really have that many other materials that we can use. This is a list of some of the materials that have been used. And in vitro, they have been um, successful, but there's a big difference, as you're aware, from in vitro translation to in vivo. Mm. And um, none of these, it's a bit like um, obturation techniques and um, RGP, none of them all fit the category <coughs> of biocompatible 
degrading at the same time as um, resorption of the rest of the tissue inside the pulp space and um, being convenient in a convenient form to actually deliver into the tooth. So these will hopefully be images that look familiar. Um, originally, a lot of the research was done on calcium hydroxide, which was, if you like, for a long time, the gold standard for apexification and apexogenesis. And um, if you were around mm -hmm. the early stages of this, then that would stay in for several months. I've got a it's question to ask. Yes. And perhaps, um, uh, you know, the audience can ask them a question. You know, we have a, a lot of ongoing um, experimental research in tissue regeneration. Yeah. And in terms of using these bioactive products, how important is the role of the mission to create the environment for the actual stem cell regeneration of the you know, it's a neural pulp or tissue? How important is the clinician's role? Yeah, we can't actually, well, we can't really, actually, well, it comes down to a couple of things. It's, it's careful case selection. So it's mm -hmm. a combination of the pre-treatment assessment, mm -hmm. um, as well as um, what we actually observe during the treatment. Usually on these types of teeth um, with good magnification light, then you can actually see to where the apical tissues would be sitting. So you get some idea of the space that you're treating. Mm -hmm. But more than that, it's, it's a question of being... Um, of knowing the stages that you need to go through and mm -hmm. not mixing up your irrigants. The order of your irrigation is really important mm -hmm. as to whether or not it's going to achieve the desired result. EDTA, which is used only at the second stage, also releases the um, fossilized um, biogenic factors that are actually stored within the dentine. So we're trying to promote um, dentinogenesis by the release of those. But if we actually did it the other way around and did um, EDTA first and then followed up with sodium hypochlorite, we're actually leaving a situation where the tooth can actually be actively um, damaged by the sodium hypochlorite and then subsequently, because the thing about immature teeth, just to remind everybody, is that the dentine tubules are really quite wide. And so therefore, as much as, yeah, we need to try and protect that. What would the last irrigation would be EDTA or sodium hypochlorite? No, no, EDTA. So the second appointment would be solely EDTA. Mm -hmm. The first appointment would be sodium hypochlorite because they were trying to disinfect. Right. Um, so, yeah, so calcium hydroxide was um, the mainstay, the gold standard. But mm -hmm. then effectively, as we all know, MTA came into the oh, 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. And most of the research actually has been done with pro-root pro MTA, which is the grey MTA, and pro-root um, Angelus, which is white MTA, mm -hmm. um, with biodentine. And the main differences here are these have very slow sets. So usually these are multi-visit treatments. You have to leave um, a dampened cotton wool pledget on top of your MTA so that it will set with time. And at the second appointment, you need to check that you have a set um, material before you place any other materials to restore the tooth. Biodentine, as I said, usually sets between nine to 12 minutes. So you can actually do it on the day and place your permanent restoration. In terms of influencing what actually happens, um, Placing the permanent seal is really important, but we also need to make sure that there's other factors like um, caries, has it all been removed? So we're not leaving because once we've removed pulp tissue, um, if it's a pulpotomy, then um, the tooth has lost its ability to respond to noxious stimuli. So what we don't want is um, a case of recurrent caries happening quite rapidly, particularly if it's on a patient with next mixed dentition where it's really difficult to control their diet. Dical obviously is a setting calcium hydroxide, but the handling characteristics of these two materials um, are not as good as um, this, these two. Um, and the calcium silicates, this is a tricalcium silicate, and obviously calcium hydroxide. I mentioned molecular factors. So overall, the whole sort of thing about pulp biology and um, the biogenics of this is that we're trying to influence some of these mediators to attracting in the right cells and ideally both temporarily and spatially so that we have some control over the process that the pulp is um, undergoing. But at the moment, this we can do a lot experimentally. We've identified more factors that are involved in all these pathways, but it's a bit like going down a rabbit hole. The more we find out, the less we actually know because then there's the next question to answer as we go through. But this is largely where- um, Can I come in for it? Yes, yes. I really love this diagram. It's a, it's a good one. It's the seriously. Do you know why I like this diagram? Because 
uh, you know, how many times do I mention it's biology that drives the equation in dentistry, not the carpentry sometimes, you know, and, and the yeah. problem is, uh, you know, I talked about the implant and, and how I mentioned like you can teach a monkey how to drill a tooth and drill the bone and put an implant, you can also teach a monkey how to cut a tooth, but to be able to learn how to apply biology. So every time you, you get a handpiece or you do anything, think about biology, how to maintain biology, how to preserve, how to enhance biology that gives you the healing required. And it's all at molecular level. There's other molecular markers, the whole concept. Yeah. If everyone pays attention to this diagram, uh, perhaps people will be less invasive in our thought process, yeah. you know, because you can always do palpectomy, always can do look at therapy. It's a last resort. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And um, oh yes, I forgot to mention I have any, I have a very long um, reading list if anybody is interested. But this is a particularly good paper, the ones I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of scaffold, something that um, the cells can actually um, attach to and then start to develop the tooth, um, hemostatic hydrogel scaffolds. So this is recent research. Um, it's really quite difficult to look because the last time I gave the lecture on this was 2018 and the same sort of caveats were there. We still don't quite have enough information. We dog study? No, this is actually mini pigs. Mini pigs. <laughs> so yeah. I've been reliably informed that mini pigs have a very similar physiology <laughs> <laughs> to humans, which is why this is used. And because of access, um, this treatment was undertaken experimentally on their premolars. It's too difficult, too challenging to get access to the molar teeth. And then actually also the next thing was um, trying to actually get radiographs. But effectively, preoperatively, this is the tooth and then um, the pulp was extirpated and MTA placed. So we can see that, yes, there was some difficulty in undertaking this work and not all the MTA is uniformly placed. Um, the reviews were done at four weeks and 12 weeks, but we can see in comparison that we have got an increase in the length yeah. of the roots of the tooth, yeah. and we can see that we still got something that represents um, a non radio dense um, area. And then at 12 weeks, we can see that we're beginning to get some form of apical closure yeah. and the ends of the roots of the tooth. So this is always a good type of research because if it's in less than ideal circumstances and it works, then it's a bit like the early studies um, that Torah did. Mm -hmm. um, then we know that this material is actually, this, this, this whole process and protocol is worth engaging in. An so we have happy pigs, basically, right? Well, well yes. Mine uh, happy mini pigs, pigs, right? Yes, okay. Mini pigs, yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> That's right. So, and basically the two hydrostatic gels, one is gelatin based, which actually dissolves very readily, and that gave more favorable results. All of these agents um, all cause some degree of inflammation, and they found that fibrin actually caused quite a bit of inflammation. I didn't include the radiographs here, but it caused um, signs where we could see um, resorption within the roots. But at the end of the 12 weeks, it still healed satisfactorily and in the presence of apical periodontitis. Mm -hmm. uh, did I say that? I did say that. Mm -hmm. So um, success, what are we looking for in terms of success? Well, our definition of success may be different to our patients, but effectively we're looking for an absence of signs and symptoms. And if it's a pulpotomy that we can actually assess pulp vitality at least one year afterwards. The only guidelines that really kind of exist would be from the ESE and they recommend six 12 month review and really here, particularly if it's traumatized tooth, we're looking to make sure we've got no other changes associated with the original injury and the adjacent teeth. And then the maximum period that we would actually follow it up would be four years. And the typical reason for that is that on average, it takes about three to four years for a root to fully develop for um, an anterior tooth and the vast majority of traumatized teeth are anterior teeth and the assessment that we would do are exactly what we mentioned before history taking pulp sensibility testing radiography i did actually omit to mention that um, on the teeth that you saw or the, the traumatized tooth that you saw um, treated um, a cbct was taken and the reason for that is um, intra oral periodical radiographs it's happened to me once um, I it didn't pick up, you taken at two different angles, the 30 degree horizontal shift of the tube, did not pick up that I had um, a complicated root fracture in the tooth and um, endodontic treatment had been initiated before I saw the patient. Um, and because of patient size, I decided against um, 
taken a CT scan at that stage and that would be the last time I see a trauma case and not take a CT scan on the rest. So having talked mm -hmm. exhaustively about this, uh, it's, it's a good idea to look at the outcomes and where do we sit with this as a, as a genuine treatment modality. So I said that there was inconsistency between the papers, that a lot of the time the techniques are used on teeth which are in which have no caries, no obvious signs of um, pulpal inflammation. But in terms of um, an indirect pulp cap, this originally used to get um, a very poor um, success rate. And there are two ways of doing this. It's very rarely performed as a single stage um, procedure, unless of course you're using biodenty, but um, usually it's a two stage step so that you leave the, um, the last layer of um, effective dentine just over the pulp floor and then you go in at the second stage and remove that final bit once you can see radiographically you've got a dentine barrier but the success rate still 90 percent and the period of time was within one to two years for review as we know there's problems with reviews direct um cap similarly we've got um this is cariously exposed teeth so um 87 to 95 percent and pulpotomy, still reasonable, 93 to 96%. Revascularization and continued rope formations. Well, when they've looked at the tissues, we know that actually we don't really have revascularization, um, but we do get continued root formation. Now it's a wide variation here, but this is because this included studies where calcium hydroxide yeah. had been used and calcium hydroxide typically does, didn't always um, attract a good success rate because of lack of sealing ability. Um, but the evidence indicates that if in doubt about the pulp status preoperatively, and even when we're looking at um, the pulp to see how much bleeding there is, that we take a conservative approach. And really the basis for that um, is because Sarkis already mentioned, we can always go back in um, with a view to doing endodontic, you know, root canal treatment afterwards. Um, does sort of just tuck it in here appropriate information for consent so i've never had a patient actually refuse a vital pulp can I ask a question yes with after 12 months uh would you consider the pulp testing to see this vital or would you do i mean it's well it just depends if so if it's a pulp, partial pulp or two, there'll be some coronal pulp there mm -hmm. um so is it hot cold or maybe cold it's oh cold well, actually i do all of it so so um do i do hot no actually i don't do hot um, I only use heat if I'm trying to reproduce symptoms to actually mm -hmm. diagnose the yeah. cause tattoo. So it's usually EPT. What heat do you use? What heat do you use? Do you order on GP or? No, no, no. So um, I actually will boil the kettle and pop some hot water into a syringe, mm -hmm. test it on me first. But the tooth that I'm, all the teeth that I'm testing, or the quadrant that I'm testing, the teeth will be isolated in turn with rubber dam. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it is, but usually we pinpoint the tooth and then. And that gives, yeah, usually these patients are not, they're usually in pain to quite a severe degree. Mm -hmm. So, but once we can identify the tooth or the two suspected teeth, usually it's right. two suspected. Thank you, thank you. No, that's all right. So in summary, at the moment, from what we can say from these procedures are, um, with the evidence, calcium silicates are the preferred biomaterial. Most of the research has been done with MTA and biosilicates, but um, the advantages are, as I said, because the patient factor in terms of success is they don't want a discolored tooth. And if you've ever used MTA and then noticed at the point where you've done your colpotomy that a year later they've got discoloration, it's a really difficult thing to actually rectify. Um, but then actually I haven't used um, Sarkis's few techniques on resin, so I think I'll be taking some notes from this. Um, pulp inflammation is actually the deciding factor pre-treatment symptoms and um, observations clinically while we're undertaking it as to which pr procedure might be most um, appropriate and it would appear there is no limitation at the moment on the age of patients um, the size of the perforation well not really perforation on the size of exposure um, against doing undertaking a really vital pulp treatment but um, it would appear that the younger pulps may have a better outcome we don't really have a strong body of evidence for this and the main reasons for that would be um, the large amount of tooth tissue blood supply um, as the older we get um, there are age changes that happen within the tooth which can compromise its ability as well as any comorbidities I, oh, I think I have
it's so lovely. So thank you. <laughs> well, because our well questions, enthusiastic. Thank you, Please do. Maybe I'll show the question. I want to have a look at that. Uh, Shrada, is there questions that it's coming up? What's happening? Uh, I'm just trying to look at the. Uh, are you there, Shrada? No. Let me just find out what's going on here. Just one second. Okay, now let's get the questions. All right, a few questions here. Now, um, okay, what rationale for using have a chloride or achieving those tests? Could you use another solution such as saline? Okay, so saline um, won't achieve hemostasis. That's basically it. What you're doing there is just flushing the cavity. And the hemostasis is, is obviously important because until we get to that stage, we can't actually place our um, biomaterial. So, um, yeah, we do know, and it has to be hypochlorite. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing else that does that. It actually denatures proteins, so it actually affects coagulation, correct? In a yes, way. yes. Right. And that, 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 because it's denaturing, um, that's why um, I favor the lower concentrations. I may have colleagues who actually don't mind which concentration they use, but I mean, it's certainly not heated, but definitely I prefer um, 1%. Okay, the next question is from Kristen Hurley. What are the major indicators for successful endocrine treatment? Oh, yeah. So we had a slide on that. So basically, it would be patient symptoms that they're asymptomatic. Um, that radiographically, if it's um, an immature tooth with um, apical periodontitis, that we have some form of um, dentine barrier, apex formation, increase in length, and hopefully thickness of the walls of the tooth um, apically. And um, in terms of the um, repair vital pulp therapy. So that's the direct pulp cap, indirect pulp cap. Radiographically, you can actually see between um, the pulp chamber and um, your biomaterial, um, a barrier of dentine forming. And that would have the same radio density as the rest of the healthy dentine in the crown of the tooth. And so mm -hmm. that would be a good indication. May I take this question further? This is a very good question for Monica. Uh, in terms of uh, successful endodontic outcome, yes. uh, from the endodontist point of view, you have completed the endodontics, you've got a good seal. Now, what role lies on the restorative dentist to make sure that, that this tooth will have its best potential for survival? What is the restorative dentist's role in terms of loss of survival of this teeth that is structurally compromised? Yes, I think after we can um, ascertain that the, the, the tooth is stable, then if um, there's any form of coronal weakness, that basically we return, that you want to take your next stage. Mm -hmm. But it can't be done. Um, so pulps do react to the amount of tooth structure that's actually removed. And um, we wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend um, restoring the tooth, even with something like a veneer, or unless it was an additive um, restoration to the tooth for at least a good six months, if not a year. Okay, so, I'll yeah. come to that question again. Mm -hmm. There's a question in terms of if you need orthodontics, there's a non vital tooth, or it's a tooth with immature apex. Where would you do the orthodontics? Would you wait for orthodontic treatment and uh, make sure that the tooth is asymptomatic, or would you try to not to complete the root canal therapy? But, uh, you know, I mean, where, where, what's your call on that? I do that. Mm -hmm. the, um, so, you talked, you, but you want the tooth that I've done. Vital pulp therapy. Let's say you have vital pulp therapy. The child needs orthodontic care. Okay, so if it's fully formed tooth and it's um, a direct mm -hmm. pulp cap, then yes, the orthodontics can be undertaken. Right. That's okay. And then we just monitor them radiographically. Yes, okay. but I probably would recommend waiting for you. or no. No, well, it depends on the orthodontist. So most of the specialists I've spoken to have said that they use light and um, light horses. Yes, yes mm -hmm. and um, and basically then they can. They, they usually ask for the completion of the endodontic treatment mm -hmm. and then they will just do that and usually there's no problems with root resorption. I think it's slightly different if we've got apical periodontitis in an immature root. I'd need the apical periodontitis to heal because I wouldn't want to super. Well, because the other thing is that we can get healing from um, apical periodontitis um, in terms of what we can see um, of, as bony healing, but it can actually um, revert. In a short period of time afterwards, and I wouldn't want that to 
coincide with orthodontic treatment. So usually if they can manage, they leave that tooth out of the active movement mm -hmm. until they've got everything else into place and then usually Okay, thank you. Right. The last yeah. question is in this central place. It is from uh, I mean, here again to the GRC based private to restore and to be composite resident in bio within 10 years. This one here. No, uh, but the sound, but the idea of the good questions. So it is, yes. Yeah. Um, I think, did you ask the one about the resin modified? Um, GRC uh, or somebody asked it, but um, no, the reason for doing multi layers is so that we it's to do with this idea of seal so we're not relying on one material only to undertake that task and multi-layers seem to be more successful you also have grc bonds to the dentine and the better bonds to dentine than composite i think that's your point to understand while composite bonds well to the enamel and creates great seal the grc will give you better seal under the composite to improve on that uh, the next question is thank you for that question treatment plan is that right? what happens during internal root absorption this one ravi does any of the bond materials will be able to reverse the resorption process mm. no but so the, internal root resorption um tells that there's pulp inflammation but the depth at which it's at is usually within the middle to apical thirds of the root it's not often that we actually get it back chromally um, but it also implies that the chromal pulp portion of the pulp is not necessarily vital or it's certainly deeply inflamed. Um, so we'd actually have to remove the pulp. I, I don't really think there's many options uh, because if we don't and we put a bioceramic um, on around and in that space, then um, we may not be able to remove it, particularly if it's MTA, to then actually conventionally treat the apical portion. So in the situation of internal resorption, you know, once we've actually got that, um, we, we have to make a decision. But it also depends on things like, um, is the tooth symptomatic? Um, if the tooth isn't asymptomatic, it could be monitored. Um, but if you've got, um, but sometimes internal res res resorption can externally perforate as well. And usually it's not just, well, it's very rare that I've seen a case where it's just the one thing. It's usually a whole mix of different factors, which usually ends up with um, endodontic full root canal treatment and mm -hmm. management from there. The next question is from Royal Shams. It's, uh, uh, no, actually it's from Priya. Um, it's treatment plan for asymptomatic external cervical resorption cavity. It's then the final issue exam. Okay, so it kind of depends. First of all, is it visible? Um, it depends which aspect of the tooth. Is it buccal or lingual? Is it um, confined to the chromal part of the root structure? Does it actually, has it started to invade into the crown of the tooth? External, so it really is hyperplastic external cervical resorption. And what actually happens is there's a point of entry, but then um, it will then start to infiltrate in the dentinal tubules. And it doesn't actually encroach on pulp space because of the peritubular um, layer around it. Um, so it's invasive. But this particular type of um, resorption is infiltrative. So if you imagine dentine as a sponge, or it's like a fungus growing, all those small little um, hyphae that then start to extend into the dentinal tubule. So it really depends on the size of it as well. If when you take a radiograph, and usually you'd have to take a C, get a CBCT scan as well, if it's um, like a saucer-shaped depression lesion and you can't see an extension down into the roots or up into the crown of the tooth, then you can actually treat it like a single surface um, subgingival restoration. And if there's symptoms, then yes, you would undertake endodontic treatment. If you find in excavating that tissue, you've exposed the pulp, probably would undertake endodontic treatment. And um, because you can't, because trying anything at the cervical area and at the um, gingival level can be really difficult to control in terms of avoiding a secondary infection. So yeah, um, yeah so oral hygiene is really important. So yeah. But if it's the invasive type, then it depends on the classification. Good question. Another, Thank you. So <laughs> so this is from Royal Shams. Please explain the use of triple antibiotic in the oh. statute of pulp regeneration. Did you talk question. about that? Yes. 
So um, it was originally thought that in order good observation, to... good yes. good listening. I didn't read that. Sorry. So so initially it was recommended as part of the process that instead of irrigating the space of um, an immature um, tooth with apical periodontitis, that actually a triple antibiotic. What are they? What's the what's Yeah, the so it was minocycline, metronidazole, and ciprofloxacin. Right. And um, it would sort of mix into this paste and then place inside the canal. The the normal problems with trying to apply um, an antibiotic topically, two of those antibiotics would be active against gram negative, so that was the main premise, and one was active against both gram positive and gram negative. But um, there are issues with staining and um, hypersensitivity and also the effectiveness. So though it may have a reasonably broad spectrum, we're not really certain that in that affected case, the organisms were treating, and I'm never comfortable about sticking um, antibiotics into teeth. Well, we really just don't know what the um, organisms are. But it was dropped um, oh, in somewhere in the 2000s as um, not actually being indicated because the success rate or the outcome wasn't any better um, for using that. And actually, it's a really difficult thing to place and actually obtain because in order for it to have a reasonable shelf life, you actually had to get the three separate antibiotics and kind of mix it together. Um, and because that variation and because it's dosage sensitive, we, we, yeah, it's, it's, it's too um, inexact. So no, it's been abandoned and instead as the first appointment, it would be calcium hydroxide, which is far easier to manage. Okay, yeah. good. Next, Anita, uh, again, uh, does the duration, the duration it, it takes to achieve hemostasis have any correlation with the status of the pulp? And if so, what would alter your treatment options? That's yeah. the first part of the question. So the first part of the question would be, yes, anything more than five minutes, you then resect down another couple of millimetres and then irrigate, dry, and then observe it for hemostasis. But once you get to the CEJ, then um, if it hasn't stopped at that stage, then you probably are looking at a palpectomy and initiating root canal treatment. The classic thing, and actually I haven't mentioned it until now, is that um, all symptoms our patients present with and this idea of reversible and irreversible pulpitis and the extent of inflammation within the pulp tissue. A lot of the time, the statistics really quite high. We can get these really severe patient um, symptoms from a uh, patient reporting really severe symptoms, but actually histologically, when eventually the tooth has been removed, um, there's no sign of inflammatory change within the pulp tissue. So there's definitely um, a neural component or psychological component mm -hmm. to it and um, we have no, no way even if we've done a really thorough history of assessing the pulp tissue until we actually get in there. So you may have encountered a situation where you've tried to initiate endodontic treatment for a pulpitic molar and then just found that actually the hemorrhagic pulp has just been bleeding up, filling up the pulp, your access cavity, flowing onto your dental dam, and that can go up to 30 minutes. Well, in that case, you're definitely doing the right treatment because that pulp is so badly inflamed, it really needs to be removed. There's no way we can actually place any material that would function against there. So, so that's a good question. So the idea is have a coffee in between while you're waiting for the pulp to still bleed. <laughs> yes. So if you're a good coffee drinker, that's the time you never coffee. Okay, so, just out of curiosity, what oh, method of observation would you use in routine practice? That's a good question. A very good question here. Uh, we use conventional lateral condensation along with thermal compaction. I know about lateral condensation. What would you say about that? Oh, yeah, look, so, so the so whereas I might have thought everybody has moved towards a heat based technique, yeah, system B, right? You can system B, is that what you're talking about, right? Okay. The um, I don't very really noticed myself, so that's one, yes, no, no, no. Um, lateral condensation for a large proportion of the world is actually the main technique. And if that's what you've got in your practice and you can't influence what material, yeah, what your equipment is and what your materials is, there's nothing really wrong with it. Because the, the thing to remember is it's all in our case selection, which actually then determines a good proportion of um, our outcome. Um, so, and until we started to get all these very fancy bits of equipment that allowed us to assess our healing and success rates, um, in close up. Um, lateral condensation was the um, gold standard. It superseded single point silver points mm -hmm. and so we have a vast amount of um, cases where we've had lateral condensation. So really probably 
it's not so much what we put in, it's what we take out, and it's the coronal seal that has the longevity for the tooth, but you ask me the question. So you're using a hybrid technique, and that's fine. Um, the method I use is, um, yeah, it's Steve Buchanan's way of compensation, yeah, and um, backfill with the thermoplastic. That's why there's two of them, but maybe they mossy. Okay, my question is, okay, on the Mesia Baca Canal of the lower molars, would you use natural condensation? No, well, I don't change my technique now. But before, I mean, it was number one cause of roof fracture, wasn't it? Before that press down. Oh, so yes, yeah, so it should be mentioned then. So natural condensation, instead of using a handle spreader, we shouldn't be, because the handle spreader allows us to, yeah. um, if we're not actually careful, you have to be really focused on it um, to actually allow a, a leverage force. And that's definitely a no-no. So um, I'm sure you're using... It's about finesse, not about force. Yes. It's, right. it, the, the single point, um, the, the, the finger spreaders. So basically, along the long axis of your spreader, you can apply that up into the root canal system and um, condense your points that way. And it's always against the portion of the root, which has got the bulk of denting, not on the more fragile inner facation side. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have a I have a question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Always all the question. If, if I mean I'm happy to wait for more questions, but I think uh, it would be good to ask the question in terms of what would be uh, okay. Let's say you have a tooth that's a young, immature tooth that's yeah. you know you've fought for four years and and you've managed to maintain that tooth in a single asymptomatic mm -hmm. stage now. In terms of having a really thin root, okay, uh, in, and if the child needs to one day to be able to restore that tooth, right? You have two components, it's holding well, so there's a bit of a line in between, and then suddenly they're not happy with us, so they, you know, go to the dentist, who have no idea what's happened in the past, doesn't check the history, yeah. and decides to, well, I can veneer this, or I can do a crown. Mm -hmm. Tell me what was the consequences of that? I mean, you know, in terms of doing more work on these teeth, I mean, where did you cause more damage because tooth had been repaired and blood circulation was established? What's the chance of causing further damage if you try to invade that tooth for the sake of cosmetic improvement? Well, so the time interval was four years after mm -hmm. the initial yeah. procedure, so technically the root should have fully formed by mm -hmm. the same, whichever way it is. Was this a Mature tooth with a patient. Yeah, another patient, let's say 14, 15. Why don't they say 16? Yeah. So, really, it's all to do, well, it's actually your field. It's to do with um, weakening the chrome stru tooth structure, or sure. removal of tooth structure. So, it could only favor adhesive techniques okay, and okay. really minimal veneers. And the, the key thing really would be that. Um, so I have had young boys, mostly not girls, um, patients, and they've just decided whatever sport it is they're doing, whether it's professional skateboarding, um, and they keep damaging their teeth, and then we save it first time, and then they come back and they've redone the injury, and it's, 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 the teeth is deteriorating, but they're still too young for um, implants. So we really just maintain it oh, as best we can. Implants will be a big no, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but um, so, but this is a real practical matter because usually it's not the, the patient themselves; it's actually their parent. Okay, what happens when the tooth becomes non-vital? Yes. And they come to you, have placed the root canal therapy. You seal with a GP as much as you could, but you're very hard to get a ethical seal. But you managed to do that. Yes. What treatment would you recommend in terms of trying to build a tooth core, although it's got a guarded prognosis? But you need to wait the child for the next, you know, five to ten years before they consider any form of implants or other form of therapy. Yeah, what would you recommend in terms of creating a, you know, final coronal structure? Well, actually, then, then fibre post a core. Fibre post. If you're losing that much tooth structure, or even just to reinforce what remaining coronal tooth structure. So there's, a, there's a study where talk about placing a. Uh, Rebound type of fibers inside the canal and bowling and building up. Have you had any experience with that? No, I haven't actually. I've just placed straightforward um, fiber 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 posts. Fiber yes. Fiber. But the, the body of evidence would appear to be that that is a successful modality for restoration. Mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a lot of um, research on it. 
uh, it kind of comes down course courses. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. I think the occlusal factors do play a role. Yeah. Very well. Okay. Any other questions from our very enchanting participants? I mean, it's been a wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I've had a few of my friends send me SMS saying, What a wonderful lecture you are. And, That's very uh, nice. You things. speak well, and they love your accent, by the way. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is great. I mean, Jeez. imagine me asking you for your accent, and we're mine. <laughs> and, and, uh, it's been a delightful evening and uh, we'd like to thank you for you know, being with us and coming to the college. We would like to have the opportunity to also invite you again. And, uh, and uh, any more questions? Or shall we say goodbye? Any more questions from anyone? Oh, no, so if, you, if you were interested in um, a reading list, um, you can get me on either of these two. Or two more chats. Two more chats. Oh, are there some? Can you apply dental implant? The root cause therapy. What do you mean by that? Can you apply dental? Oh, you mean if the tooth has failed? Uh huh. Well, it's probably more sarcus has failed. Um, age, it, age plays a important role here. Yeah. My um, my understanding is that if there's apical periodontitis, that you can't put an immediately um, immediate placement for um, an implant, um, and um, there has to be a period of time before between um, removal of the tooth and um, healing and whether you let the healing take place naturally and then wait with some good form of temporization for the patient um, and then wait um, until you can see that there's clear evidence of healing the CTC on a small volume CT scan um, and then proceed with the implant or uh, if there's lots of loss of bone then also consider a bone graft that's it oh hi Catherine thank you <laughs> Any other questions? Well, may I just say thank you again one more time and thank you everyone for joining us. Okay. The lecture will be on the platform at the ICLVP. If you log in, you can you know, watch this lecture again. And uh, uh, all my colleagues, uh, Christine and uh, Dr. Mehdi Rami and Garima will be lecturing for the college in the near future. So. Uh, there'll be more opportunities for you to learn. Um, and uh, again, uh, thank you for, for being with us. I think uh, the important part is uh, that to be able to interact with, I think the various questions were very oh, interactive. Were great questions, actually. And um, we have a good, very receptive uh, audience here, or very experienced, most of them are very experienced. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. I will say goodbye to you. And um, well, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Have a great evening. Thank you for having me and enjoy your endo. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Sargus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the good evening. I hope you liked it. And. Uh, Any good questions? Yeah. No, good questions. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, thank you all. Okay, you take care. We'll, uh, we'll catch up. Two weeks time. It'll be, it'll be, uh, we might have another editor speaking um, or we might um, have a surprise for you. So wait till you see us in two weeks time. Anitya, I think you have questions, mate. Appreciate that. Okay, keep it up, okay? And keep reading. Appreciate it. Really, well done. Well, I'm, I'm proud of you. Okay, thank you all. I'll say I'll leave now and um, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.